Imagine a family watching television every night. At first, there are only a handful of channels, let's say six to be precise. But suddenly, the audiovisual offer explodes so that the family now spends the evenings zapping from one channel to the other. However, quickly, there are now thousands of channels so that most of the channels are never actually explored by the family. To make the most of the audiovisual offer, the family subscribes to a zapping service to better enjoy the whole offer. Every half an hour, the zapping service changes channel to discover other programs. At first, the family finds the service strange, but little by little, they get used to it and recognize that the service is actually better to find innovative and entertaining programs than the laborious effort of manual zapping. Of course, it often happens that the family does not appreciate the proposed zapping, but they can themselves change the channel to be watched. But in fact, it's even easier to just ask the service to zap once again if the program they are watching is not to their liking. Eventually, the zapping service learns the family's preferences and the zapping is more and more in line with the family's preferences. Therefore, little by little, the family reacts less and less when the zapping service selects the audiovisual content to consume next. And as the service improves, it also accelerates with a zapping every 5 minutes and even for more and more users, a zapping every 30 seconds. Year after year, however, the family slides along a slippery slope, which leads them to consume content that is increasingly polarizing and even more and more enraging and hateful towards other communities. Exposed daily to the normalization of calls for violence, the family itself has become radicalized and finds the democracy in which they live in no longer suitable. They want to silence the voices of the minorities and return to a powerful leader to restore order in society. They even consider that those who still demand dialogue are actually threatening their country and that power must be taken back from the corrupt authorities using vote or, if necessary, using force. Moreover, increasingly, the example of the Chinese authoritarianism, where dissenting voices are not polluting the public space, this looks more and more like an example for the family to follow. After all, all the images that the family sees from this country represent a united, ordered and prosperous nation, while all sorts of fun parties are regularly held to celebrate the country. As you might have guessed, the informational dystopia that introduced this video is in fact an analogy to the services of the social network TikTok. So let's do a quick review of what TikTok is. Unless you've arrived from a parallel universe, you probably know that TikTok is a social network which has gained a lot of popularity recently. TikTok relies mostly on short vertical videos, often between 15 seconds and 1 minute, although it is possible to upload longer videos. It launched in 2016 in its Chinese version, where it is actually called Douyin, but it was quickly commercialized worldwide. Incidentally, the connection between TikTok and Douyin is quite strange. While both platforms have the same interface, the content of one cannot be accessed by the other, and vice versa. On the other hand, Douyin is a much more complete application since it allows, for instance, to book hotels. Finally, let's point out a potentially disturbing feature of Douyin, namely the search of videos by faces. In a country where face recognition is already overused and abused in concerning scales by authorities. This means that Douyin is able to find videos where an individual appears simply based on a picture of that individual. Or to put it in another way, Douyin is building a database of images which can identify all those who have appeared at some point in a Douyin content. This will make it easy to find compromising content on me, which sounds a bit scary. Legally speaking, TikTok and Douyin belong to a company called ByteDance. Now, ByteDance is incorporated in the Cayman Islands. Apparently, Chinese businessmen also like tax evasion. Oh, sorry, I mean to say tax optimization. However, the head office of ByteDance is in Beijing, the Chinese capital. ByteDance also develops other products, including Tutiao, a platform for personalized recommendations of news sites. And I don't know who wrote the Tutiao Wikipedia page, but the page insists a lot on the very sophisticated machine learning developed and deployed for this recommendation. 
Today, TikTok is the social network that is exploding in popularity, especially among young people. In 2020, TikTok has exceeded 2 billion downloads on mobile. And while the fraction of American teens using Facebook or Twitter has dropped over the past half decade, TikTok has overtaken Instagram and Snapchat to become the second most used social network behind YouTube and even the most used social media among children. This being said, TikTok isn't used by young people only. All sorts of age groups are present on TikTok. And crucially, far from the collective conception according to which TikTok is all about dense videos, TikTok is playing an increasingly central role in the dissemination of information. According to a study by the Pew Research Institute, while the fraction of Twitter users who regularly follow news on Twitter is declining, which also holds for Facebook, Reddit, and YouTube, TikTok users increasingly learn about the world directly through the TikTok application. In other words, TikTok's remote control, previously used to mostly swipe from one entertainment channel to another, this remote control seems to be used more and more for zapping between news channels. And this should sound terrifying. Especially since this TikTok zapper, this recommendation algorithm that chooses which video to play next for which user, this algorithm is really much more powerful on TikTok than it is on platforms like YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Indeed, on TikTok, by default and on mobile apps, there is no notion of video to click on. The recommendation algorithm zaps and plays the next video without the user taking any action whatsoever. TikTok's algorithm is extremely powerful. And that should generate a lot of curiosity and attention for this algorithm. How is it programmed? What is its goal? And who decides what that goal is? Who has the power to harness the monumental power of TikTok's remote control? ByteDance is a private company, and one could think that, as such, it is independent from the Chinese Communist Party. At least, this is what TikTok themselves claim. But of course, because of the lack of audit of TikTok's information infrastructure, the American authorities are not convinced by TikTok's statements. And given that even companies from democratic countries lie, including two scientists who often accept their lies, there is indeed reason to be skeptical, especially when we consider the geopolitical stakes to which we will come back. But just to get an idea of the geopolitical stakes, it is instructive to keep in mind a figure shared and published by the Strategic Research Institute of the Military School in France, namely 20 million Chinese people are apparently paid by the Chinese authorities to produce this information, including 2 million of them at full time. Moreover, the case of Jack Ma, ex-CEO of Alibaba and fifth largest fortune in China, is particularly worrying. This businessman, well known for his statements changing of China's one-party rule, mysteriously disappeared from October 2020 to January 2021. And strangely, he became less critical afterwards. And Jack Ma is not an isolated case. There's also the tennis woman Peng Shui and the journalist Huang Shuikin. But the case of Jack Ma in particular seems in fact representative of a greater attention given by the Chinese government to Chinese digital companies. And ByteDance, the company that develops TikTok, is no exception. For example, in 2021, Zhang Yiming, CEO of ByteDance and second richest man in China, resigned at the age of only 38, which is rather strange. In April 2021, the Internet Investment Fund in China, a state-owned enterprise of the Cyberspace Administration of China, bought shares in ByteDance, which allowed it to place a government official, Wu Shungang, on ByteDance's board of directors. Then, in 2022, the Chinese government itself bought shares in ByteDance. Finally, as a result of increasingly compromising elements, in November 2022, TikTok finally admitted that staff in China could indeed access European users' data, and the same is probably true of US users' data. That being said, so far, TikTok still insists that Xi Jinping's government does not have access to this data. Do you believe them? TikTok's recommendation algorithm is thus an overpowered remote control that the dictator Xi Jinping can probably reprogram if he wants to. But how much would he want to change the algorithm? What are the geopolitical stakes 
behind the control over the TikTok remote control? Well, to answer this question, I invited Jean-Louis Fourquet, journalist and content creator on the YouTube channel Après la Bière, to come and talk to us about it. Well, uh, China can very well, thanks to TikTok, direct stories which are broadcasted on internal issues. For example, and randomly, on the repression suffered by the Uyghur people in the province of Xinjiang. And it already does so, in fact. On TikTok app, where China has to be a little more discreet than on Douyin, yeah, don't mess around, it's the app that young Americans spend the most time, even more than uh, YouTube. So on TikTok, we have among the top 100 videos with the hashtag Xinjiang, so the province of origin of the Uyghur, 88 videos that are either downright pro-Chinese narrative or neutral. Basically, the Uyghurs are doing just fine, according to these 88 videos. 88% reminds of a Soviet Union election score, but precisely, China will not necessarily need to do an old-fashioned censorship by deleting videos that do not go in its direction. It will be enough for it to simply give more visibility to the videos which go in its direction. The mass of the video doing, the other videos will be naturally invisibilized in the flow. This ability of a power to push stories that suit it on a planetary scale already has today and will have even more tomorrow an enormous influence on all geopolitical confrontations. The fact of pushing stories abroad that suit us and that destabilize opposing regime as name is cognitive warfare. And that is exactly what the president of Taiwan refers when he accused China of it in September 2022, saying of it that it also waged cognitive warfare using false information to disturb people's mind. To undermine Taiwan's position, China, for example, appears to have released information aimed at tricking Taiwan and US allies into believing that the US military cannot help defend Taiwan. We have here yet another version of the old strategy of demobilizing the opposing camp, like when Trump convinced people who leaned rather in favor of Hillary Clinton not to vote in 2016. Perhaps TikTok will be an overpowered weapon in the cognitive wars that the Chinese regime will wage tomorrow. Perhaps TikTok is to cognitive warfare what the nuclear bomb was to conventional warfare. In any case, we are dealing with TikTok with the emergence of an even more elaborate and powerful weapon than the tools used for Russian interference through the Facebook network in 2016 American elections. It is easier to discreetly spread disinformation when one owns a network on which it is broadcasted than when it is the adversary's network. It's much more effective to interfere when you have full control of the overpowered remote control of the application on which the citizen user of the countries you want to weaken spend one hour and 30 minutes per day on average. And this control of the overpowered remote China can use it to strengthen its geopolitical position on a planetary scale, on a whole bunch of topics. For example, it could decide to give a sounding board to content that weakens democracy, which gives good image of China to the Asian and African markets, which claim that even the zero COVID policy was a big success. For now, the TikTok application innocently suggests the searches vaccine COVID injuries, vaccine COVID truth, vaccine COVID HIV and vaccine COVID warnings to anyone who has started the search COVID vaccine. But another planetary topic could also be massively influenced by the TikTok remote control. For me, the topic that all newspapers should talk about constantly. As if there was a world war going on. As Greta said in 2016. Of course, I want to talk about the climate change. China could very well, thanks to TikTok, minimize its responsibility in climate change. But when we know that China would emit more GHGs than all the developed countries together, we realize that if China wants to push a story that coal-fired power plants, it's not so bad for climate change, that's not going to help. And the strategies and types of content China can push to improve its geopolitical stance on climate change through its super remote are countless. It can, of course, promote narratives that would mitigate its responsibility for climate change, but it could also disseminate narratives that exaggerate its participation in the climate fight, denigrate other countries' climate action, or push the narrative that climate change is not so real. For example, according to the same paper as for the COVID, 
the auto completion of TikTok orients rather in the direction of the last option. When one search is climate change, TikTok will suggest the search for climate change debunked and climate change does not exist. And besides, why choose one particular strategy over another since it's not really one overpowered remote control which China has control over, but 1 billion and 700 million overpowered remote controls, as many as you have Douyin and TikTok users. So of course, there are two major remote control brands one more suited to the Chinese market and the other more to the foreign market. But it remained the same manufacturer for the 1.7 billion remote controls. And when you have control over all these remote controls, why not apply all the strategies at the same time depending on the audience? China could promote its own energy independence with uh, content in favor of solar energy among Chinese citizens, while demobilizing the citizens of all the states on the topic of their energy independence. This is already a strategy that Russia had employed with Russia today in 2021 on vaccination by promoting the vaccine and exposing anti-vaccine conspiracies inside Russia and doing almost strictly the opposite outside. Except that with TikTok, it will be easier, more discreet and on a larger scale. Of course, it is for the moment more or less fiction, still based on real facts, but the fact that it is even possible should put us all on red alert. Because we must be aware that the algorithmic censorship of TikTok risks being much more discreet, insidious and much less obvious to detect and combat than the ones we are used to. And it will be done on a planetary scale, which is to say how dangerous it is to leave control over this overpowered remote control to China climatically and globally in fact. Because as Lei explained at the beginning of this video, TikTok's remote control is much more powerful than the one of the other platforms. It was already frightening that 70% of the content watched on YouTube, that is to say 700 million hours per day, was recommended by the recommendation algorithm of a private entity whose sole purpose is to make the most possible money. How not to be revolted at the idea that with the enormous success of TikTok, we in fact have almost 100% of the content watched, which is recommended by a recommendation algorithm completely mastered by an authoritarian state whose president affirms that he wants to improve the system for communication across all platforms of media and create a new environment of mainstream public opinion and improve the system for conducting comprehensive cyberspace management and foster a healthy online environment. For me, recommendation algorithms are to the living organism humanity what cognitive biases are to the human individual. They filter information. Knowing that, is it really reasonable for the living organism humanity to leave the remote control of its attention to an entity like TikTok. Trying to think of ourselves as an enormous living organism that must try to organize its flow of information in order to live through 21st century that risks putting us to the test, that is precisely what I'm talking about on my channel. So if you want to learn some French, uh, don't hesitate to watch some videos and subscribe if you're interested. In the meantime, I let Le talk about that precisely. This problem that the algorithmic governance of this enormous living organism, of which we are all a cell, should pose to all of us. Let me take this opportunity to point out that Jean Lou previously had a program in Arrêt sur Image in France. But this was interrupted because, according to the producers, Jean Lou had discussed all that could be discussed about recommendation algorithms. As you may have understood if you follow me, I consider that this subject of recommendation algorithms is actually more important and more complex than all the quite important and complex topics like climate change. And therefore, to assert that not more can be said about this topic seems to me to be a serious error of judgment. Imagine if someone said on a TV program that the program will stop talking about climate change because everything has already been said about the topic. This will probably upset a lot of ecologists, while I would argue that what happened in RS sur image is at least as infuriating. Too often for my taste, the attention is focused on the data extracted by TikTok. And yes, in a way, TikTok is a formidable spyware, that is, an application that does surveillance and which is installed on the phones of billions of people around the world. But if TikTok is absolutely terrifying to me, it's not at all because of this. 
It's much more because of the remote control that controls the daily informational exposure for billions of people. What's more, this remote control is extremely opaque. It is extremely difficult to understand how TikTok organizes the flow of information. Does TikTok de-recommend news stories about Uyghurs? That is, do they artificially decrease their recommendations, a method also known as shadow banning? What about videos on climate change, for which China is increasingly responsible? On the other hand, does TikTok amplify calls to hate of extreme far-right movements? Does it give much more visibility to clashes and disinformation? Today, because of the opacity of TikTok, it is impossible to provide quantitative answers to these questions. And this opacity reinforces the power of nuisance of the Chinese authorities who can thus harm democracies without their attacks being identifiable. Worse yet, the huge ongoing controversies over moderations actually act as a strategic distraction, which is a well-documented strategy of the Chinese disinformation. In other words, moderation gets all the attention from the media, politicians and regulators, so much so that new regulations like the European Union's Digital Services Act, or DSA, include many restrictions and requirements for moderation, but they completely ignore the problem of recommendation. As I could see myself when I was invited in the committee experts of ARCOM, the Authority for Regulation of Audiovisual and Digital Communication, which is supposed to apply the DSA in France. Unfortunately, as a consequence, the auditing and regulation of recommendation algorithms is today seriously underfunded and neglected, so much so that it is essentially today almost non-existent, even though we are talking here about a national security issue. Yet, the necessary means for adequate audits would be enormous, especially since TikTok's remote controls are ultra-personalized. The recommendations made to a TikTok account are in fact not at all representative of the recommendations made to other TikTok accounts who may be more prone to radicalization or more easily victims of strategic distraction. Typically, there may be AI researchers who are much more willing to be amazed by gadgets that generate photorealistic images than likely to focus on the dangers of recommendation algorithms. In fact, the auditing problem is even more complex. For one thing, the recommendations made today by TikTok are not necessarily representative of the recommendations that TikTok will be making in the years to come. After all, TikTok is still in a phase of enormous growth in this context, the Chinese authorities have in fact the incentive to persevere in the quest for market share so that its remote control gets installed in more phones throughout the world. But to achieve this, TikTok's incentives are to avoid controversies such as questionable TikTok recommendations that would raise concerns. Given this, it's not actually surprising if, for the time being, TikTok's remote control is still primarily used to deliver entertaining content. In fact, the main concern with TikTok should not be recommendations made today by the TikTok algorithm. The main concern should be about the governance of this TikTok remote control who today and tomorrow will have the power to reprogram this remote control? To whom are we ceding the power to manage the flow of information around the world? More than a frontal attack on democracy, TikTok should be regarded as a Trojan horse, a distracting offering that could one day trigger the collapse of democracies. Now, this video focuses a lot on TikTok because it is a particularly striking example, but the concerns we've raised here actually apply to all of the world's most powerful remote controls. Who controls the recommendation algorithm of YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn? Who will control them tomorrow? And who will control those who have control over these remote controls? As you probably know, Twitter was recently bought by Elon Musk, a billionaire who has been quick to take actions that are of great concerns to anyone who cares about the quality of information, cyberbullying, and the dangerous proliferation of hate speech. Twitter is also partly owned by funds linked to the Saudi Arabian monarchy, as well as to Qatar, two countries known for their recurrent human rights abuses and for their use of malwares. Moreover, two employees of Twitter have been charged by the Department of Justice in the US with spying for Saudi Arabia. Telegram, meanwhile, is headquartered in the United Arab Emirates, most likely involved in horrific massacres, including in Libya, Yemen, and Ethiopia. What's more, contrary to what is often announced, Telegram by default is not encrypted. 
And above all, Telegram is not open source and it is not a free software. Or at least only the front end, that is the application that you download, is open source. However, what Telegram does with your unencrypted data is completely opaque and relies on unknown proprietary software. Facebook seems to have followed the shareholders' demands for several years, which has led them to prioritize again and again profits over the security of entire populations that are now victims of genocide, including in Myanmar, Tigray, and India. Moreover, the free code of Mastodon has been hijacked by Donald Trump, who used it to create his social network, Truth Social, a veritable nest of radicalization where instead of retweeting other people's messages, you can retruth them. Just as open source deep learning algorithms can be reused to produce deepfakes, disinformation, and cyberbullying, these solutions are weapons that malicious entities can easily misuse. Developing weapons that will clearly be misused and without any possibility to govern over their use seems extremely dangerous to me. Finally, Google literally propelled dangerous disinformation like Didier Raoult through its remote control, which probably led to thousands of additional deaths of COVID, but also and above all led to a dangerous normalization or rejection of authorities and a dangerous loss of confidence in public institutions and in scientists. And if you still think that Google is cool, Google fired its ethics team and is misleading the scientific community by misinforming about the security of its algorithms so that Google can speed up the much too hasty deployment of new and more personalized remote controls, which are constantly being manipulated by troll campaigns. More generally, in the age of spywares, including one that seems to have been planted into the application for the COP27 summit in Egypt, any major system of influence controlled by a handful of individuals may in fact be under the control of malicious entities who can exploit threats or blackmails to control those who control the information systems. In fact, these concerns go beyond the remote controls, since many heads of states seem to have been spied on by spywares for years, including the French President Emmanuel Macron and the former British Prime Minister Liz Truss. Overall, national security seems to require a more decentralized and not unilateral control over any remote control of massive information flows through the web. Or to put it in another way, there is an urgent need for collaborative governance of the web. Let me stress that this is not what Mastodon, this open source and free alternative to Twitter, is proposing, as Mastodon instead allows anyone to create their own governance, but this governance will only apply to those who have agreed to join the instance using this governance. In fact, the very design of Mastodon encourages filter bubbles like Truth Social and Gab Social, and thus favors the emergence of radicalization nests responsible for their own moderation, and which are thus impossible to moderate by outsiders to these communities except through the law, but then this raises the issue of law enforcement, which is extremely hard on the web and has been largely ignored, especially when it comes to advertisements online. In fact, this example shows that decentralizing governance is not enough. It is also necessary that this governance applies to all users to avoid that those who refuse to hear about climate change or compassion for vulnerable populations can further isolate themselves, get radicalized, and thus represent a threat for these vulnerable populations. Okay, so governance needs to be decentralized and applied to all. But what tools is out there to allow a collaborative governance of remote controls in particular? Well, as far as I know, and I've gone through a lot of the scientific literature on the topic, there is only one deployed project of advanced and secure collaborative governance, namely the Tournesol project. And while I'm not going to rehash the pitch of what Tournesol is, but I hope that this video helps you better understand the need Tournesol addresses. And if you too think that governing remote controls collaboratively is critical for national security, as well as for peace around the world, I strongly encourage you to participate in our project by creating an account and comparing videos to collaboratively program the Tunoso remote control. Remote controls have become out of control. Tools like Tunoso are indispensable to retake control of them collaboratively. I hope to have convinced you that from now on and even more so in years to come, the TikTok remote control is a weapon of mass destruction in the information and cognitive war between the world's superpowers, a weapon that is arguably more terrifying than climate change and Putin's nuclear threats. 
Yet in a terribly frustrating way, the danger posed by this remote control is a huge mute news. Few people talk about TikTok as a danger, and even fewer are focusing on the recommendation algorithm rather than the extraction of personal data or the moderation problem. And again, in this video, we only talked about the risks of malicious use of TikTok's remote control. In practice, this maliciousness is not even necessary to harm society. TikTok is already having a dramatic impact on users' attention spans, as well as on their mental health and their productivity. So much so that access to Douyin, the Chinese version of TikTok, is restricted in China. For example, children under 14 are only allowed 40 minutes a day on Douyin. Therefore, given all these harmful consequences of TikTok and the danger represented by the access that the Chinese dictatorship has to the remote control of TikTok, it seems urgent to seriously question the massive adoption of the social network. Bringing people to TikTok is increasing our informational dependence on the Chinese authorities in a more insidious way than Germany's dependence on Russian gas or on the Chinese market. TikTok should not be regarded as cool. TikTok should be regarded as a societal danger. That said, boycotting TikTok individually will not be enough. After all, TikTok affects more than just its users. By skewing the attention of those users, TikTok is a threat to all of society and in particular to the prioritization of important issues and to collective decision making. Furthermore, auditing TikTok will not be enough. Even if these audits are necessary to better understand what TikTok recommends, they will be saying nothing about what TikTok will recommend in the future once it has successfully infiltrated democracies and once Xi Jinping will decide to exploit this infiltration to modify TikTok's remote control and make it massively amplify disinformation and hate in democracies. So individual moves and auditing are not sufficient. What is left then? Should TikTok be banned, as India has, and as some members of the US Federal Communication Commission suggest, even if it means making billions of customers unhappy? Or can we envisage a takeover of TikTok in Europe or in the US? Or even perhaps a nationalization of the service offered by the social network? It seems to me that there is an urgent need to take strong decisions to protect democracies. However, I insist on this again, the problem of the security of social networks, especially against disinformation, cyberbullying and hate, will not be solved unless we first require a collaborative, transparent and auditable governance of the remote controls of these social media, which first requires effective and secure tools for collaborative governance of these remote controls. In short, what we seem to need above all today to secure our democracies is I think, to secure, develop, and promote platforms like Tournosol. And to achieve this very concretely today, we especially need much more attention, contributions, and funding to Tournosol. So once again, I urge you to learn more about our project, to promote it to your friends and family and co-workers, to provide video comparisons to feed our database and identify top quality content, to contribute to the open source development of our code, and to donate to the Tournosol Association, or even to call for funds and foundations to consider financing a web that is finally multilaterally, collaboratively, and securely governed. I hope to have convinced you that the future of our societies depends on it.